Okay. Uh, let's go into uh, Numbers chapter 6. Last week we were talking about the jealousy offering when somebody, uh, a husband, would become jealous of his wife and uh, determining if it would be uh, a right thing or a wrong thing. God was very intent with his people back then and uh, inside the nation. I think uh, one part of that, I can see why one part of that, I thought maybe this is, it's going to spread into uh, this next session, but uh, usually in chapter 6, most people go back to chapter 6 when they're uh, going through Judges chapter 13 and uh, because of Samson. Yep. Uh, Samson was, we're going to be talking today about, some, uh, about the Nazarite, okay, the vow of a Nazarite. Uh, probably one of the, um, for me, it was it's one of the areas of scripture. Although I understand the vow, I didn't understand. I didn't un understand the. Um, how much should I say? Uh, I understand the vow. I understand how it's done. Okay, but what I never understood was the outside picture of look, being able to think outside the box. Well, now I understand. It. Now that I study it, you can. Uh, now that I studied it, I can understand a little bit more. Uh, I'm not touching the hem of the garment, obviously, uh, but understanding is a little bit better in that area. So why don't we jump in to the uh, vow of the Nazarite and see what uh, see what the Lord has for us? And the Bible says in chapter six and the uh, Numbers chapter six, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dry. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days of that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, or for, for his brother, or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. Father, bless thy word tonight and give us wisdom from it. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, uh, this, is, uh, the, this is like uh, the vow of the Nazarite. You can see it, and you can see there's the thing of he puts his locks in like seven locks and he lets them come down. He doesn't shave them. He doesn't shave them, it says. Uh, you'll notice it said no razor... Uh, should come near his head, okay? No razor is to come near his head. I didn't know this thing was hanging and running around. Okay, that's a lot better. Uh, no razor was to come near his head. And um, there's a few people in the Bible that were Nazarites. Okay? Yeah, they were terrible. <laughs> Let's see some people. Okay. Uh, just as an example, just as an example, they're the few people that became that that were Nazarites. Okay, we know Samson. Okay, we know Samson was. We actually know that uh, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, was. Now the difference between Samuel and any other person that I ever seen, or any other uh, uh, that was named a Nazarite, Samuel never uh, he, he never lost his whole life. Okay, which is a pretty uh, big thing. Samson, he never lost it 
But think about this. He did, but he never did what he was supposed to do. And he was disobedient guy. And um, the it's presumed that uh, John the Baptist was also, but we don't know that. Okay? We know that he didn't drink a uh, strong drink. And there are basically your uh, three that we know of. Um, later on, I'm going to show you uh, another one. I'm going to show you another one in the Bible. Uh, just so you know, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of people at the very end. Okay? And um, if you would, let's uh, let's Let's look down at, uh, let's go over to Amos, because this is a great honor to be a Nazarite. Go to Amos chapter uh, 2, Amos chapter 2, because this is a great honor to be a Nazarite, to be able to separate yourself unto the Lord. Now that's what it said, it said separate yourself, and it's made sure he understood, separate yourself unto uh, the Lord, okay? Amos, in Amos chapter 2, for the great honor. <coughs> Amos is after the book of Joel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Amos was a street preacher. And uh, the word Nazarite, Nazar, is, the, the word Nazar means separate. That's what it means, separate, Nazar. Okay, uh, Amos chapter 2, and if you would, look down at, uh, let's go down to verse, Amos chapter 2. Uh, look down at uh, verse number, uh, let's start at verse number 10. It says, also I, I brought you up uh, from the land of Egypt, led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite, and I raised up your sons for prophets. Now watch what it says. And of your young men for what? Nazarites. So it's a pretty big honor to be put with the prophets that he turns around and he puts a Nazarite in there. Nazarites, uh, is it not even thus, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Uh, but he gave the Nazarites, what did it say? Wine, wine to drink in verse number 12. You gave them wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. He didn't want the preachers to preach and he wanted to corrupt the Nazarite. Don't let the preachers preach. And uh, just so you know, we're at that stage right now. Don't let the preachers preach and uh, and give wine to the Nazarites. Okay? And we see, I mean, man, there are some, uh, there are some uh, churches out there. I mean, I, I, I saw one, uh, it said, um, what did it say? Uh, uh, Jesus on tap. And what it is, is this is how crazy things are. Uh, a group of people calling themselves Christian, not Christian, I say. But they uh, they go to the bar and they drink. And that's Jesus on top. Now you think that's great, huh? No. That's pretty pathetic, considering who Jesus Christ is. Making a mock at Jesus Christ. And they probably laugh about it. And you got to understand, uh, they make a mock at sin today. People make a mock. Men make a mock at sin today. Uh, they're wicked today. Okay, so uh, but it's a great honor to be a Nazarite and uh, to keep to keep to that status. Um, look at verse number two. It says, "Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman." Now, isn't that something? This is the first time. What's that? There's a woman. This this is trying to tell you that anyone can do it. It says, "Man or woman." Now, I think what happened here. What woman would do this? Well, maybe the woman that was uh, innocent back there in chapter uh, in chapter five. Remember, they said if they do the dust, the what if she's innocent and the thigh doesn't rot, or it, what if she's innocent in chapter five? You know, and then she turns around, and she says, "See, I, I told you I was pure because uh, she kept her purity." There you go. She could get zealous and become a Nazarite or something like that. It says here that a man or a woman—that's anyone. Uh, shall separate themselves to vow. Now listen to that, to vow a vow. Now if you vow a vow on the Lord, what does he say? You better keep it. Yeah. You best keep that vow. If you vow the vow of a Nazarite, it says to separate unto the Lord. We're talking about somebody who's kind of like a super saint. Uh, go to Lamentations chapter 4. It's uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, then 
Lamentations. It's very small. If you breathe too heavy, you go right past it. It's like a small town of Wagachi. If you, if you blink, you're, the, you're, you're through it, you know? What chapter? Uh, Lamentations uh, chapter uh, 4. Now, uh, look down at, uh, in chapter 4, we have, it's uh, in the first verse, it's the siege of Jerusalem. He says, uh, how is the gold become dim? That's the, gold is a picture of deity. How is, how is the gold become dim? Uh, how is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are uh, poured out in the top of every street. Uh, the precious sons of Zion, it brings up in uh, comparable to the, to the fine gold. How are uh, they esteemed as earthen pitchers, uh, the work of the hands of the potter? Look down at uh, verse number 7. It says her Nazarites. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. Uh, they were whiter than milk. Uh, they were more ruddy in body, in, in body than rubies. Their polishing was sapphire. Sapphire. Uh, their vis visage is blacker than a coal. Uh, they are not known uh, in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like a, a stick. Now, talking about her Nazarites, and what did it say? They're supposed to be what? Purer than it said snow. What's that? They're not, they're, they're trying to, look, it's like this. You take a vow, and it says, if you ever try not to sin? Yeah, sure, you try every day. You're in the book and everything. You're trying not to sin. And that's what they're trying to do. Keep themselves right. Keep themselves uh, with a zealousness. And um, let's go over to... Um, I'll go over to that one next. These are guys that want to be super saints. Look at verse number uh, 3. Now, verse number 3, it says, um, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, Neither shall he drink liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dried. All the days of his separation shall, eat, shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree. Nothing of the vine tree uh, from the kernels even uh, to the husk. Uh, what we're looking at here, he says, uh, no drink. No drink and don't even look at it. Don't even touch that grape thing. Okay, now you have to understand something about the grape. Now I could go into Judges and... There's an area of judges where he actually explains four different trees. Uh, we know that in the garden there were a lot of trees, but there were two that were really named. And one was a uh, one one tree. What happened to be the tree uh, the tree of life, and the other tree was the tree of the knowledge the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, and of course you know which tree they picked. They didn't pick the tree of life. They picked the tree of the knowledge. See, people, knowledge uh, puffeth up. Knowledge actually condemn. It can condemn you. And uh, that's what happened when they picked that tree. Now, did you notice the tree, when it talks about that tree, it'll talk about trees and, in Judges, and there, one of the trees that it talks about is a vine tree. Now, the vine tree can produce, produces great. It produces those fruits. But you have to understand something about the vine tree. It's not like good for anything else. What are you going to use it for? Uh, anybody here going to cut some wood out of it? get some lumber, uh, make a house out of it or anything like that. No, you're not going to get anything out of it. It's kind of a useless tree other than that. Uh, but it can produce good things and bad things, and those good things could be grape juice, new wine, or you could go the other way and get some hooch. You know, it's, um, I always say it like this, it's old wine for the old man and new wine for the new man. Which one you like is up to you. Well, you want to act like the old man or you want to act like the new man? That's where it comes your uh, your stand in life. Okay. Now, uh, when you deal with uh, the things in it, now it's when it's when it's uh, nice and ripe, it's a grape, and it has some nice juice in it. But what if I was to turn around and let it decay? And when I de when I let it decay, what does it become? It becomes a vinegar, an acidy vinegar. Uh, now, if I turn around and I put some yeast in there, and I let it sit. 
Now you know what it becomes. What does it become? It becomes a uh, old wine. It becomes uh, it decays. Becomes wine. And what does that do? That makes you what drunk, right? And what does drunkenness do for you? It distorts your judgment. Yeah, it does. Now I've heard people say, well, wine's good for you. I got to tell you this. Actually, the new wine's much better for you. Um, but people bring this up, and uh, I had I had people ask me. I'm going to tell you just this is the easy way to look at it. Okay. Uh, there is no verse that said don't drink in the Bible for a Christian. There's a, there's verses that say if you're uh, if you're a deacon or you're a pastor, yeah, you can't, you shouldn't be drinking. You should be, uh, you should not. That's your that's your way. Okay, but I can't, I couldn't find any. But uh, I'll give it to you like this: wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging. And who is deceived uh, thereby is not wise. It's not wise. It's a mocker. Okay, it distorts your judgment. Um, there were. Uh, there's a lot of times in the Bible you'll see that people have drank. Uh, we know a guy by the name of Noah. Went out, became a husband, started to drink. What happened? Something got messed up. He got he got to the point where he didn't know what he was doing, and things happened in his family. Uh, the, it's it's never leads to anything good. Drunkenness never leads to anything good. Okay. Uh, I always say it like this: um, wine, wine, fermented wine is a dissolving drink. It'll dissolve your income. It'll dissolve your marriage if you let it. It'll dissolve all your friendships. It's a dissolving drink. And it'll dissolve your life. Yeah, it'll dissolve your life. Uh, if you don't believe that, go down to AA and look at it for a while. Go down to the rehabs and go see the people there. And right. see how it's done for them. You know, I, I, there's nobody there's nobody at the end of their life that's that's drank that much that can turn around and say, hey, man, it's a great thing you should try. Right. You know? Uh, it's something you maybe shouldn't try. Uh, go over to... Uh, Go over to Proverbs chapter uh, 31. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Proverbs uh, 20, 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 and Look down at uh, verse number four. It starts, it says, uh, it, it is not for, for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, or, nor for princes strong drink. Now watch what it says. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Okay? So, um, Look, if, if somebody's going to die and it says it even in the next verse, I'm not a problem with that. I mean, don't 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 keep uh, if somebody's in pain. You've seen people go away. Uh, don't keep it from them. Why? Why should somebody have to sit there and suffer? Right. You understand what I'm saying? Don't be that. I always say it like this. Don't be so spinster. Take somebody out of the misery. Okay. You already know they're going away. Why not get them out of the misery? All right. So. Uh, that's one thing, but I know there's a whole bunch of people that actually go to the verse in uh, 1 Timothy, I think it's 1 Timothy chapter uh, 5, uh, I guess it's verse 22, I remember, and it says, talking to Timothy, and he says, uh, take a, uh, don't drink any more water, he says, but uh, take a little uh, wine for thy stomach's sake, and often infirmities, okay? So it has a healing bit to it because alcohol... Uh, alcohol can be is an antiseptic and help uh, from bacteria that can be in your system. But um, he's telling him that. Now, this is the reason Paul's saying that. Uh, neither He's telling him not to drink water. Now, why would he tell him that? The water was bad where he was at. Okay, it's like going to Mexico, okay? He picked up, Paul, he picked up an infection. And Paul's like, okay, here, you got an infection, drink a little wine, it'll be good for you. Okay, get rid of the infection that's inside of you. Drink a little wine for that. It'll help your system. Okay, so uh, Paul brings that out for him. And uh, there's a few other people that, that became Nazarites in the uh, Bible, but we'll get into the Rechabites. Remember the Rechabites? They stopped drinking in, in the, uh, I can't remember where that is. That's the book of uh, Jeremiah, the Rechabites. And God said that they liked them people. You know, they were... Uh, get away from the, the booze and everything. They they did good things. And but God doesn't look good and too well at fermented liquor. I, I'll go to go to Isaiah 28. Here's a good one. Isaiah 28. 
See, God looks at his, at his people and he says, uh, I, I, you know, God loves his people. And he wants good leaders for his people. Uh, good leaders lead from the front. They don't lead from the basement. Amen. Isaiah 28. Amen. Isaiah 28. I would never vote for a man that hides in his basement. I would never do it. I got to tell you the truth. I'd never wear. I would never vote for a. I would never vote for a leader who uh, found comfort in any type of mask that they wear right now. You ask me why. I said, because a leader needs to be out there and be not afraid of things. Amen. 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 Leaders lead from the front and not from the basement. Amen. Now, uh, the Lord had some problems in Israel, and he was in, in Isaiah 28. He says, uh, now look down at verse number 9. He's talking about his own priest, and he, he turns around and... It, uh, in 28 now I want you to real fast look over to verse number 1 and 28 first he says woe uh, to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim whose glorious beauty is fading flower so there uh, he had a problem with the drunkards look at verse number 3 he says the crown of pride the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet okay so we know what we're kind of looking at there uh, look at verse number 7 he says uh, about some of his people his, his priest he said but they also uh, have tr have aired through wine. They've aired through wine and through strong drink and are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have aired through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They're getting drunk. You know any uh, you know any priests or uh, pastors in any religion or anything that drink wine? Right down the road. In Michigan, where I used to live, they had a special place for all priests. Mm-hmm. Because they were drunkards. Yeah. I see that in movies and read about that. Yeah. They, uh, you get some drinking involved. Now watch what God says. And he says, look at verse number 9 in Isaiah 28. They erred. They started drinking. They swallowed up the wine. And he says, uh, whom, shall he, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he uh, make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. He just dealt with people. He said, these priests, they have their drunkards. And then he comes down and starts saying, who's going to teach the Bible? What is he saying? Not them. Right. Not them, guys. They're not going to teach it. He says, why is that? Look at verse 10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Okay? For with stammering lips. That's what a drunkard is. For with stammering lips and another tongue, uh, Will he speak to this people? To whom he said, This is the this is the rest uh, wherewith he may cause uh, the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, uh, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, these scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. God doesn't have a very big outlook on old wine. He says, you're not going to be able to do it right. You're not going to be able I don't want you teaching the Bible. Hey, look, I'll give it to you even more. Stop witnessing the people that are drunk. Right. They're not sober. You need a sober mind to get saved. Right. Why would you talk to somebody drunk? I've done it. Guess what? It goes nowhere. Right. Okay, it goes nowhere. You want sound people. Uh, back in um, uh, Numbers chapter 6, he talked about the vine tree. And now look at verse number uh, 5. He says, And uh, all the days of his vow, of his separation, there shall no razor, there shall no razor come upon uh, his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days of his, that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. No around no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean. What? For his father? For his mother? For his brother? For his sister? When they die. Why is that? Because the consecration of his God is upon his head. Okay, uh, so is he going to funerals? No, he's not going to funerals. 
you imagine how this is not easy to do. This fail is not easy to do, especially uh, if somebody dies in your family. Why? Well, you got to go pay your respects. You ever hear people say you got to go pay your respects? Uh, they'll tell you um, that you should go. Do you ever get shamed and not going something by your family? What do you think these guys were going through? They were getting, they were getting, they, they, they would get shamed like that. You know, you should go. But God says it's very, this is very sacred of a thing here. Uh, he told you all those days. Guess what he told you you were? Holy. You were holy those days. And uh, he's looking at verse number eight. He says, all the days of his separation. He is holy unto the Lord. Whoever it is, a man or a woman. Did you notice it can be a man or it can be a woman? This is something anybody can do. Okay? You can take the vow of a Nazarite. Let's look at verse number nine. Because what happens is now they got the vow, they actually, they could start to serve the Lord. But some things come about things, and we'll see what comes in. It says in verse number 9, uh, And if any man die very suddenly by him, and he hath defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall, shall he shave it. On the eighth day he shall bring two turtles and two young pigeons, uh, to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the priest shall offer uh, one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for that he sinned by the dead, and shall hallow his head uh, the same dead. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation, and bring and shall bring a lamb of the first year, for the trespass offering, but the days that were before shall be lost because of uh, his separation it was defiled. So what's going to happen here is they're going to reset the clock. Okay? Don't you wish we could do that once in a while? Let's just reset the clock. We have those buttons on some of our appliances and stuff, but it would be great if we could reset the clock. You say, how can you, uh, we can't, but we can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. What does it say? A good man fall down how many times? Seven. He gets right back up. Okay? What, is, what do you think repentance is for? What do you think forgiveness is for? What do you think God's going to turn around like you do and go after people and say, I remember what you did? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? God's not like that. All right? So, uh, some things happen, and you might have to reset the clock here. Um, and there's a difference in things. I'll give you the difference. Sometimes it's accidental. You see how it said somebody suddenly died. There's what we call accidental. That's an accidental sin. You, how could he have helped that? So we had a heart attack right next to him. But then there's what we call presumptive sin. That means you did it. Right. You wanted to do it. Right. Uh, if you ever notice the guy Samson that's in the Bible, what he had was what we call presumptive sin. He did it and he never, uh, he, didn't, he didn't repent of it. I got to tell you, if you really read the story, what happens is God actually pays the uh, sacrifices for him. His, uh, he, he did lose his wife. He did lose his father-in-law. And that's right there. He lost a ewe lamb. And he lost a he lamb. And then, of course, at the end, who dies? He does. What's he? Well, he could be the ram. He walked out even Stephen. And if you remember, he also got his head shaved. By who? Delilah. And then God went one thing further and helped him out. What's that? Plucked his eyes out. Because he always had a problem with them. I'd like God to do that for you. I got a problem. You got a problem with your eyes? Okay, I'll pluck them out. Help you out there. It's tough. What did God say? If thy eye offend thee, do what? Pluck it out. You're better off. Right. Amen. You tell you the truth, that'd be all men today. If the Holy Spirit was that close to the church and we were that looking at that, we'd be like plucking our eyes out. Why? Because we all got a problem with those. So <laughs> he told me, he said, like, he told him, he said, uh, uh, and he shall, he's going to consecrate himself. Let's go over to, um, go to Ezekiel chapter 33.
something accidental come in and something happened. Look down at um, Ezekiel 33. Let's look down at uh, verse number 13. He says, And when I shall say to the righteous that he shall shortly live if he trusts to his own righteousness and, and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be what? Remember. Remember. Right. It's not going to be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he's going to die for it. Okay? Uh, look back at uh, uh, Numbers chapter 6 and what happened. If somebody had to die. And look, we got a lamb for it. Why is that? Because his, it says because his separation was to fire. We've got to reset that clock. We've got to set, reset the clock. And, uh, and God says, I, I, there's some things you're going to have to do here. There's some things you're going to have to do. And, and here's how... Here's how it's gonna. Here's how it's gonna end here. Uh, look at verse number thirteen. Verse number thirteen. And in verse number thirteen, it says, uh, "And and this is the law of the Nazarite: when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation." There's number one. What's the first thing? Go to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And. He shall offer his offering to the Lord. Number two, one he lamb. Of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. And one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for the sin offering. There is number two. Number three. First, go to the go to the tabernacle, the door. Bring a he lamb, number two. Bring a ewe lamb, number three. Okay, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings. That's number four. Now here comes number five. Look at verse number 15. And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their offering, and their drink offering. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, just so you know, that number five was there. And he shall bring him before the Lord and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord. With the basket of unleavened bread, the priest shall offer also his meat offering and his drink offering. Number six. And the Nazarite shall shave his head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall take the hair of his head of the separation, and shall put it in the fire, which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. Okay, so we got six things he's going to do here. Now, let's read through. That way we'll get to the end. I'm going to comment on it. Uh, verse number uh, 19, And the priest shall take the sod and shoulder of the ram, and one unleavened cake out of the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is a this is holy for the priest. With the wave breast and the heave shoulder and after uh, that, the Nazarite, what, what might he do? First time. See, he's out of the separation. God says, go, go have some grape juice, man. Go have some grape juice with it. Okay? And he says, this is the law of the Nazarite, verse 21 who hath vowed it, and his offering unto the Lord for his separation, beside that his hand shall get, according to the vow which he vowed. So he must do after the law of his uh, separation, okay? Now, I don't know if you noticed something, but this was a voluntary thing of free will. Whether a man or a woman wants to be a super saint, basically, and say, hey, look, I want to be a super saint. I'm going to go for it. But you notice what happened uh, after he's done. Now, this doesn't even fit the church today. After he's done the separation, he's the one that's got to bring the sacrifices. I mean, that isn't like the church. You know what the church today does? Okay, the church today, I was a super saint for a while, did it for a while. Hey, uh, hold on a second. Let's give this guy Let's give this guy a plaque. Well, let's give him an honor, you know, and a plaque and everything else. And God's like, hey, wait a second here. You know, he vowed a vow, and I, but that's not the way... That's not the way man thinks and the way God thinks. Okay? Man thinks everybody should get a pat on the back and clap their hands. Okay? But God doesn't say that. I'll tell you why. God's looking at something else. Uh, number one, 
I can see the sacrifices for this. You should be thanking God that you were able to do the foul and that he got you through it. Okay, that's number one. He got you through that vow. It's not like you did it yourself. He's the one that does the work. Uh, the other thing is, you have to understand one thing about God, and you, you notice this in the Bible, you ain't that special. You ain't that special. That's right. That's right, amen. You, the, the greatest thing about you is you're saved. Right. The greatest thing about you is you got God in you. Right. Okay? But the problem we have is we do one little thing. We want to pat on the back for everything. Mm -hmm. And God's sitting there saying, oh, well, wait a second here. You know, do you, do you realize what it said in Romans chapter 12? You're supposed to offer your body a what? A living sacrifice. Okay? That's what God said. That's your reasonable, he said. What's that? that? That would be reasonable. That would be reasonable, he says, to give over. But this isn't doing that. God's saying, look, this is the thing. You should be happy I allow you to get better, to be better. I, I guess people think, you know, oh, well, he's a pastor, he's an elder, he's this, he's that. He's going to be up in heaven, and he's going to have a special duty. Hey, look, I always say it like this. I think God called me because he knew I wouldn't go to church unless I had to. Yeah, right. Probably. I don't know. Uh, when I started going, it took me a while to get back to church. And when it, But once I did, then, then I started going full time, basically, all the time. And, uh, but it was hard to get back into that situation. And, uh, you know, now look at it. Uh, like Yvonne knows, she knows straight out. My wife knows. Uh, Sunday comes, guess where I'm going to be? Here. I'm going to be here. Unless there's a car accident or something like that, or I get real sick or something, I'm probably going to, and I've been here sick. So it's not like that's going to hold me back either. So uh, I'd have to be really a, a lot worse of a sickness. And uh, God's trying to tell you something, and that is it's a pleasure to serve Him. Right. It's a pleasure to serve Him. And God uh, looks at, for super saints. But when they're done, you know, here, they, hey, look, you can go for a while. You can hand down. i got to say it like this. There's some people, they burn out. They just burn out. Uh, God said this is a marathon. But I can tell you this right now. Most people take it like it's a roller coaster. Amen. Amen. I see them all the time. They come in, they're... Zealous, they're gonna do that. Die. Boom, 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 boom. And next thing you know, they're out the door. I don't see them for months. You know what happened? They were in a dash. Your running style is different in a dash than it is in a marathon. You can't run that fast for that long. But in a marathon, you're trying to get to the end. Uh, go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It's right after the uh, great chapter of faith. It's all by faith, by faith, that heroes of the Old Testament by faith. And then you come into chapter 12, and he, after naming all these uh, great Old Testament saints, uh, God says in chapter 12 of uh, Hebrews, He says, Wherefore, uh, seeing we also are compassed about with the so great a cloud of witnesses, aren't we, Abraham and all of them, he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which uh, doth so easily beset us. Now watch what he says. Let us run with what? Patience. Now is that a dash? No. No, uh, running with patience is waiting for opportunity as you run, okay, and run that race. Uh, this is a marathon. Uh, the race that is, now you'll notice it said the race that is set uh, before us, what's that telling you? You know what that's telling you, Yvonne? The race is there. Why don't you get in it? Right. It's set before you. It was there before you even got there. And it's now in the presence right there. Run the race. you got to run your race, that Bible says. Run your race. I've preached it a few times. Run your race. I remember even drawing. I drew uh, chariots with horses. And it was run your race. Why? Because it's your race. God has a race for you to run. And it's a marathon and be patient in it. Okay? It's your race. And it's, like I said, it's a marathon. But you have to understand something in it. What's that? You're nothing special. Everybody else is running it too. Yes, you're the child of a king. Okay? But what makes you great, and, and just so you know, we're only friends today because of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. We're, we're only here today in this room because of Jesus Christ. Uh, we only know each other today because of Jesus Christ. So what was the name of the most common denominator in there? Jesus. was Jesus Christ. Right. I can go from here down to a church down in Florida that says maybe Bible Baptist Church or King James Church or whatever. I can walk in that church and you know what I know? Jesus I got Christ. some friends in there. Right. Amen. And you know why we're friends? Because of Jesus Christ. Right. Nothing else. Jesus Christ is the main, is the main thing. It's not just, the book is second, people. The big thing about everything is I know the God of this book. That's the big thing. Is I know the God of this book. Okay? And I should be thanking God that through this He's done great things for us. He's done it all. Okay? Now, uh, some things that you'll uh, see in the Bible. Look in at uh, that verse number. Uh, 21. Now, first, I'm gonna. Sh I want to show you some things. Uh, let's go over to the Book of Acts and go to Acts 21. We're gonna deal with Paul a little. Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter uh, 21, and uh, Paul had arrived. He went down to. Um, he had gone down to Jerusalem, okay, and uh, um, he is arriving there in verse number 15. The carriages and went up to Jerusalem. Verse 16, they uh, went. Huh? Acts 21. Oh, okay. Uh, look at verse number 16. He says, There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Nassim of Cyprus, an old disciple, with uh, whom we should lodge. And when we were come to uh, Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James. And all the elders... Uh, were present. So Paul goes in. Where did he go? He went to the church that's there. He, he checked into the church and he went to the leader of the church. Who's that? That's James. You notice it's James, not Peter. James is the leader of the church in uh, Jerusalem. That's the Lord's brother, James. Okay, James the less, they call him. Uh, verse 9, verse number, um, let's go down to uh, verse 20, actually. It says, and when they heard it, uh, they glorified the Lord, all the good things that had happened to the Gentiles. They glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, thou seest, brother, how many thousand of Jews uh, there are which believe. And they are all zealous, they're all zealous um, of the law. Okay? Uh, and they are informed of thee, they know thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, uh, neither to walk after their customs. Go down to verse 23. We see what he's saying. He's told them, you know, they didn't have to keep the law. Of course, he's saying it a little different. Uh, verse number 23 says, Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have, vow, have a vow on them. Okay? They have a vow that's um, on them here, verse number 24, of them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest uh, the law. Okay, so what's actually happening here is Paul uh, goes down. He says, "Hey, look, you've been there's a lot of lot of problems with uh, what you've been doing, Paul. As far as look, it's you're right, but you have to understand something. People around here uh, they think you're a traitor, uh, basically, and they want to kill you. So I, I want you to do some things. Show them that you actually walk orderly. You have to understand something, people, and I want you to get this in your heads." God is not about a place, we know that. He's about a person, right? In the uh, New Testament. If, if God was about a place, 
he would have moved it from the temple to the upper room because that's where everything happened, right? But you'll notice they left the upper room. It's not really mentioned again other than a few areas where Peter goes to the upper room later on. But other than that, it's not about the upper room. It's about getting people saved at this time. The temple's now the body. But at this time that Paul goes down, guess what? The competition's still there. The whole time that Jesus was on the planet, there's competition uh, after, he's, after he's done and the church starts. What's that? There's still a temple right there in Jerusalem. So there's a competition going. Uh, I, they had uh, about 40 years to listen. When they didn't listen 40 years in 70 A.D., Titus comes down, boom, it's gone. From the day Jesus is 30 to 70 A.D., there's a temple. What happens after 40 years, the number of a trial? They didn't listen. What did God do? Destroy that temple. There's no more competition, no more. No more competition whatsoever. You can't go to a place. Guess what? They got scattered. They knew where they were before. Now they're scattered. That's what Paul was dealing with. We're trying to get the Jews. Jesus had come to his own. His own received him not. To the Jew first, then to the Gentiles. They went down there. Paul had a very big burden for the Jews. You can see it in his writings. He goes, keeps going back down to Jerusalem, even though he's the apostle of the Gentiles. God said, go on, go farther. I want you to do these things. Kind of messed up his ministry going north. He, uh, he ended up in chains and in prison, stuff like that. But you have to understand something. Even though the Spirit didn't, let him go down, didn't want him to go down, he went down and he still preached the gospel. And God still, people still got saved. People still got saved. But what did Paul do? He wants to look like a super saint. That's how the Jews looked at the super saint. What did he do? He shaved his head. He, sh he shorned himself. He shaved his head he took, like he took a vow. Like he had taken a vow. Okay? And he says, you will be orderly. Now, if he's orderly, is he drinking? No. Of course he's not. Okay? He's not going to be drinking. I think he wasn't drinking anyway. But that's why he told him, you just have to shave your head. Why? Because Paul was pretty... Paul was... He said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Paul was a pretty... Uh, 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 clean guy like that, okay? So we never really had to uh, worry about those things, okay? Um, and uh, if you notice in verse number 21 with the law of the Nazarite, he said this is the law when they vow a vow of separation. Now, I want to show you some other things in here from verse 21. Go to Luke chapter 17. And then we're going to look at Jesus a little. We're going to look at Jesus. I'm going to show you something I, I saw in the Bible. And I, I want to bring it out to you. But first, uh, let's look over at... Uh, let's look over at Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter uh, 17, uh, go down to verse number, we'll go from verse number 5. And in verse number 5, the apostles, look at this says, and the apostles uh, said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you might say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and, drunk, and, and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trail not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. What's that? You should be living the holy life. You shouldn't be asking for pats on the back. You shouldn't be uh, sitting there saying, I'm the super saint. You should be taking it as these are the things I was supposed to do. Uh, you're doing the duty of God. It's the minimum. It's pretty much the minimum. It just doesn't happen that way. Okay, now I'm going to show you something I saw in the Bible. And um, 
it, it pretty much uh, it caught me a little. Uh, first, I want to go to uh, Matthew chapter 2. Now, Matthew chapter 2. Now, Matthew chapter 2, you remember that chapter about uh, Jesus after his birth and everything, things would start to happen. And he got he got called out to uh, Egypt. Matthew uh, chapter uh, 2. It says in verse number 13, it says, And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I, I bring thee word, for Herod uh, will seek the, the young child to destroy him. So they picked up, they went down to Egypt in verse 14. Okay? And uh, sojourned there for a while. Okay? And then, guess what? Verse number, uh, go to verse number 22. It says they were down there, his mother, and look what it says. But when he had heard that Archelaus uh, did reign in Judea in the room of his father uh, Herod, uh, he was afraid to go th there, thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in, dream, in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a what? Nazarene. Nazarene. Now, that's not Nazarite, is it? Nazarene. It's Nazarene, but that has a meaning. Okay, you read that, and you go right past it, Yvonne. You just don't even think about it again. Did you? You didn't think about it. Well, let's go on. I'm only picking on her. Don't worry about it. I picked on her Sunday, too. She's all right. Amen. <laughs> okay. So, uh, he says... You're going to be a, a Nazarene. Not a Nazarite, but you'll be a Nazarene. Now, uh, let's go over to um, let's go over to uh, Acts. I think it's chapter uh, I think it's chapter 20, 24. And in um, Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, um, look at, we'll start verse number one. It says, and after, the five, after, and after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended uh, with the elders and with a certain uh, orator named Tertullus, who uh, informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus uh, began to accuse him. Uh, saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness. And he's playing up to the, uh, this is a Jewish guy playing up to the leader, and he says, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. He's kissing up. We accept it always in all places, most noble Fe Fe Felix, uh, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee. I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency uh, a few words. Give us a, you can hear us for a little bit. For we have found this man, they're talking about Paul, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews through, throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the what? Nazarenes. Nazarenes. He's saying the Nazarenes are a cult. So remember what it's saying back there. It said Jesus was going to be called what? Nazarene. What do you think they were calling him? He's a cult leader is what they were calling him. He's a cult leader, that guy. That's why it's giving you a prophecy of something that's said later on. He's, he's going to be called a cult leader. Hey, look, how many of you that got saved and then started coming and getting right with God and reading King James Bible, how many of you call cults? 
Say you're in a cult. I mean, my wife's family thought I, we were sac we were we were using her for sacrifice. We were kidnapping her. <laughs> I mean, that's how crazy things can get. You start serving God. Let me tell you something. It's abnormal. Right. Who would do this? You know. What, what what do you mean you're not drinking no more? What do you mean you're not doing this stuff no more? You used to do it all the time. What does that mean? I can't stop? You, that's how people think. What do you mean you're stopping? I, I can tell you this. When I, when I got saved, I started right in. I, I started right in. I got saved. I, I went from, like, I was one of the people that got on the roller coaster, man. I started zooming down the line. I was in the 100-yard dash, basically. I got saved. I started witnessing right off the bat. And, and, and I stopped everything. I lost all, every friend I ever had. Right. <laughs> You're not at the bar no more. What's going on? I actually got invited to a party as a joke. I went there and started preaching the gospel. I pulled my Bible. I took my Bible to it, opened it up, and started reading it, talk, telling it, and, and talking to people about it. You have to, I started doing it. My friends started getting saved, yes. But there was a whole bunch that couldn't stand me. I used to have people say, you know how they cuss and stuff like that? They cuss and then they turn around and go, oh, he's a born-again Christian. Then why'd you say it in the first place? Why'd you have to say this side thing? You see, they're making fun of you. He's a Nazarene. He's the leader of a cult. Why? Take away his character, and it doesn't take much to persecute him. See, that's what they do in the world. Send, send, the, send the media over to hurt the guy, to just pound and pound and pound him. Hey, you don't even have to do that in small towns. You just send the, send the busybodies around. They'll, they'll have all your information all over the place, good or bad or true or false. I gotta tell you, I got so many, there's so many stories that false stories around about me. I like listening to them. See what I did? It's kind of listen like listening to a movie sometimes. <laughs> but that's what that's what happened. He's called a Nazarene, and then it shows up in the book of Acts that it's like a cult. Okay? Uh, they call Jesus Christ a cult leader uh, like that. But uh, and that's what happened with Paul later on. But let, let me show you something about Jesus. Let me show you something about Jesus that I, I never saw until uh, I looked at it. And I look it down at uh, verse, look at chapter uh, 26 of Matthew. Chapter 26. Of Matthew. <clears throat> and uh, let's look down there at, um, let's start in 26. 26, 26. And the Bible says um, in 26, starting in verse number 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it, he gave it. To, his, to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This is my blood of uh, the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, now watch this. That's fruit of the vine, right? Grape juice in there, right? I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What are you trying to say? Well, there's the true Nazarite. I'm not going to drink wine no more. I'm not going to drink even, I'm not even going to touch this, this fruit of the vine, grape juice. I'm not going to do it until we do it together uh, in the kingdom. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about Nazareth. We know Samson was Nazareth. He was supposed to be Nazareth, but he kind of lost it. You know, I mean, he didn't. He was disobedient with it. I mean, you know what Samson? He's kind of like the picture of. Yeah, we got people we we hang. They, they try to hang with you, and they they just can't live up to it. And they they're just but they're just hanging with you, trying to be a super saint, but they just can't hang with it. But you got to understand something. You know who the you know who the Nazarites are? They're you. Good Nazarite. How many of you are drinking? How many of you have put the Lord first in your life? How many of you have separated 
from everything else. And it is ready. You know what the best thing about it already is? Every one of you says and deflects the glory and says, no, glory to God. Amen. You just think it's normal. You've been a Nazarite all this time, and you didn't even know it. Why do you think it says not either man or woman can do it? Because you can do it in here. We're the remnant. You can lose your vow. You don't have to keep it. You can go, hey, go go to go over to fellowship. You can, you can uh, faith come by singing or something, you know? <laughs> no, they don't build a church on the Word of God. They build it on music right. and entertainment. Okay? That's not what the super saints do. They're not willing to separate themselves. They're not willing to turn around and say, well, the Word of God is that much more powerful, and I'm going to follow the Word of God. They won't do that. They, it, it, it doesn't mean anything. they got the buddy Jesus. What does the buddy Jesus mean? They take Jesus, they think they can take him to the bar and have a good time at the bar. How many of you do that? Well, let's go. I, hey, look. They think they're actually still in, they still think they're in fellowship. I hear people all the time say it to me. Well, my God would never leave me. Oh, yeah, he's in the bar drinking with you. You think he'd pull you out of that bar? It'd be a very big miracle. You know, you can go down with the best of them. Jonathan did, and he was a saved man. What, God, what I'm saying to you is, you're the modern day Nazarite. It's either man or woman. You know what you did? You took the scripture like this, you lifted it up, it said it's untouchable, and you made the Nazarite like it's an office. It's not an office, it's a vow. Yvonne, you've already taken this vow. You've been separated all this time, didn't even know it. You're in the Old Testament, people. What are you? You'd be called the super saints today. And people tell you that. I mean, you go to your family reunion, oh, they watch their mouth in front of you. They do things, that they actually go out of their way in certain areas. I mean, you should actually feel honored that they think of you that way. Why? They're equating you with Christ. Don't curse in front of them. They're born again Christians there. That's what they'll say. Like, you know, watch yourself. He's born again Christian. You know what they're really saying? He's separated. And they know it. They're not turning around and saying, you're not going, oh, well, I'm a born again Christian. They're saying, you're a born again Christian. And you know what? There's sometimes they turn around, you know what they'll say? How can you speak like, how can you cuss like that? You're, you, you're, you're supposed to be a born again Christian. Hey, I can't, we, I don't, uh, uh, some of my friends, when they got right with the Lord, you know, uh, they were out there with street preachers. Street preacher turned around and, there's my buddy, one of my buddies out there. He had a beer in his hand. And all of a sudden, this preacher came up. And the preacher starts talking to him. And handing him tracks. He goes, oh, I don't need this. I'm saved. He goes, well, what's that? That's like that one. How many times have you been told by the unsaved how to be a Christian? Isn't that something? You know what it means? You ain't acting like one. And you should be. You should be. And what is a Christian? Well, a Christian don't drink. Well, I'm a Christian. You ain't acting like one. You see? You know the best thing about this whole chapter tonight was? The biggest realization. You're already there. You never looked at it. You're always looking to sit, make it so there's so much of a step above, never realizing that you could actually be there. God says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. And you read about the priests, that's all you think about is that's a high calling. You got to say, guess what you are? Priest. The only difference is, you need to act like it. You need somebody else to call you Christian, not yourself. See, that's the 90% of everybody in this United States calls himself Christian. How many of those do other people call Christians? Because of the way they act. Very few people, very few. Isn't that so? Very few. Wasn't that a good chapter? Let's go on. Let's go to verse number 22 and we get the blessing. I wouldn't go past this without getting this last part. This is the blessing we talk about. They do, they do it in a lot of churches. They don't even know what they're saying. They get the person in the dress on Sunday morning and raises their hands. And I know I used to do it. And they used to do it in the Lutheran church. And I asked the guy, what's that blessing about? You know what he said? I don't know. What are you saying it for? They'd be cussing us out. Well, you know. Well, watch what he says. And he says in the... And the Lord spake unto uh, Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron 
and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them. Now think about this. He just turned around and said, Aaron, you're going to get some. What's that? You can bless people. Aaron's a priest, right? Amen. I'm telling you something about you. What can you do? You can bless people. You know when somebody sneezes, what do you say? Okay, I'm going to give it to you. I think you should say two or four, two more words on that. The Lord bless you. Put the Lord in there. The Lord bless you from now on. Just not God bless you. That's that's generic. Relationship. The Lord bless you. He says, "Here's the blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee." The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put whose name? The Lord's name. My name. Upon the children of Israel. And I will bless them. Go to uh, Luke chapter 24. This is a beautiful piece. The priest gets to uh, appoint, the, appoint and to bless uh, the people and and you can do that too as a priest. You can bless people. I hope you do well. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Uh, two extra words in there. The Lord bless you. Amen. Go to Luke chapter 24. The Lord just before, uh, in 24, he's going to leave the earth. And... Um, if you would, let's look down towards the end of the chapter, the very end, and look at verse number 50. He's just about to leave, and he says, and um, he's uh, he's going to he's he's done everything. He's he's uh, he's talked to them, and uh, he's died on the cross. He's resurrected, and now he gets to look at Luke 24. Go down to. Uh, Verse number uh, of 50. He says, uh, and he, he led them out as far as to Bethany. That's Remember, that's where uh, like Lazarus lived, remember? Uh, over near the Mount of Olives. He, he went over to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he what, does what? Blesses them. He blesses them. He blesses them. And he came to pass when he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. How do you bless God? Uh -huh. You thank him? Yes. Amen. You thank him. It's in that, just so you know, if you ever want to look at that, it's in Psalm 100. It says, come to the Lord with thanksgiving and bless him. Yeah. Bless his name. What's that? Thank God. That's the only, See, that's the only thing you can do. I mean, it's not like you're going you're gonna to turn around and give some, give money to God or anything like that. It's just the blessing you give is the thanking Him for what He does. And that's all He's asking for is for thanks. You know, He wants your heart and He wants thanks. You know, not, nothing nothing terribly big, but it, be a blessing. Uh, the priest can appoint you. You bless people. Uh, that's the problem we have today. We don't bless them enough. I notice that in myself. I don't bless people enough. I can use the Lord in there. I've always said, you know, oh, God will bless you, bless you, you know, uh, as far as when they see... Now I'm going to start saying, Lord bless you. Lord bless you. Why? Put him in the equation. Maybe somebody will catch it and you'll be fishing. Because we're supposed to be fishers of men. At least they'll know you know the Lord. And they know where to go when something goes wrong. How many people have that? Ah, people go about their way, running down the way. It's a, you know, a mess. Their life, when their life becomes a mess and they hit that wall, they call you sometimes. Yo, man, I need you to pray for me. You, you know why they want? They, they can't. They realize they can't pray for themselves. Some people, they turn around. And they say, "You, I need you to pray for me." Why? Because they know you're Christian. Yeah, they you know you say, the "Lord." They're not saved to their prayer with me. Yeah. Well, you can pray for them. Amen. Just something to think about with that beautiful benediction. It's something to think about being a Nazarite. Amen. You know, you guys don't drink. You guys ain't smoking, drinking, and all that other stuff. Guess what? You're already separated. You already know the book. You're already trying to do your best. Okay? You're super saint, basically, like, to look at that way. 
and you're doing good. You're doing good, man. I, Super Saints are here on Wednesday night. It's what you got. These are the people that love God, and that's what you want to do if you want to vow a vow. Why? Because God's serious about vows, right. and you ain't gonna take the vow unless you're serious about it. Right. And that's the thing about it. Take the vow. You're serious. If you're not serious, don't take the vow. Why? Because once you take it, guess what? It's mandatory. You gotta go see it through. And when you're done with your vow, guess what? We'll be in front of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for our time here. We thank you for teaching us tonight, Lord Father. We thank you for the class. We thank you, Lord God, for opening our eyes to some things that we can do it. We, we, can, we, we can, with your help, Lord God, we can get ourselves to be better. Lord Father, we can put our trust in you and and, uh, and we can get over things, Lord God, whether it be drinking, whether it be smoking, whether it be uh, loud music, uh, uh, whether it be uh, things that don't honor thee, Lord God. You said all, right, all unrighteousness is sin, uh, Lord God, and we have the ability uh, to get past all unrighteousness, Lord Father, and I want to thank you for it. Thank you for the prayers tonight, Lord God. Thank you for those churches that are praying tonight. Thank you for, uh, like Hal Roscoe's church that's going to pray tomorrow night, and Jim Rose church, they're going to pray tomorrow night, Lord God. Uh, Lord God, I, I pray they remember us, Lord Father, in their prayers. I pray, Lord God, that most of all that they're thanking you and thanking you, Lord, for everything they do. Thank you, Lord, for that preacher out there too, uh, Hal Roscoe. And thank you for his wife and his family. I thank you for everything, Lord God, in this church and our spiritualness, Lord God, and the people that got saved here. And we thank you, Lord God, that uh, we took a vow and we're continuing on the vow, Lord Father. Uh, thank you, Lord, for being very good to us. And thank you, Lord, for another church in Plattsburgh, and also, Lord God, uh, Fellowship Baptist Church in Watertown that are now uh, not just uh, reading the King James, Lord God, they're believing it. We thank you for all you do, and we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.